For our first scripture reading, I am going to read Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 25. Matthew 24, beginning at verse 1. Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to its buildings. Do you see these things, he asked? Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Tell us, they said, when will this happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? Jesus answered, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other, and many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, spoken through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the housetop go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to take their cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great distress, unequaled from the beginning of the world until now and never to be equaled again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened. At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you ahead of time. Amen. For the message, uh, please turn your Bibles to Matthew 25, verses 31 to the end of the chapter. This will conclude our series in Jesus' uh, sermon, uh, the uh, Olivet Discourse. And we read the first passage to set the context, and now this is the passage we'll focus on this morning. Matthew 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was in sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Amen. These sobering words are the words of the Lord. Frequently, dividing a group of people into two is no big deal. Many times I have stood at center ice counting jersey colors, trying to figure out how to split all the pickup hockey players into two teams with roughly even numbers. Within hours of getting off the ice, no one really remembers the process of picking teams. 
The point is to play and have fun. In complete contrast, before us this morning in the Holy Word of God is the most sobering of separations. One group, all of humanity, is divided into two. Why are they divided? What is the basis for the division? We are familiar with this text. They are divided by Jesus, the judge of the world. They are divided based on their relationship to him. On one side are the faithful, on the other the faithless. Those who have received the grace of God are separated from those who do not know God's saving grace. Those who are his genuine followers are accepted into heaven where they will be eternally blessed. Those who did not know Jesus Christ are cast away into eternal hell. There is a lot at stake. These are vitally important and extremely sobering words. The gravity of the situation explains why Jesus has been so adamant in the previous sections, wanting people to be ready and prepared for his return. Only those who come to him in repentance and faith will enjoy everlasting life. This is the heart of the Savior. Jesus wants people to come to him for forgiveness and eternal rest. Have you? Have you come to Jesus? Before we turn to this final section in what is called the Olivet Discourse, let us do a brief recap of what Jesus has already communicated to his disciples in chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew's Gospel. Our first point is the summary of the sermon. The sermon that Jesus gives in these two chapters is an extended answer to the disciples' question in chapter 24, verse 3. In response to Jesus telling them that the temple in Jerusalem would be destroyed, the disciples ask, When will that terrible event happen? When will Jesus return, and what will be the signs of the end of the age? The disciples wrongly believed that the destruction of Jerusalem would coincide with Jesus' return. They did not realize that they were actually asking two separate questions of the timing of certain events, and not one. Because they have an incorrect understanding about what is to come and the end times, Jesus seeks to correct their thinking so that they and his future followers may be equipped to persevere in living for and serving him in the present age while we anticipate the glory to come. The lessons that they are taught are instructive for us today, especially given the challenges of living for Christ through this pandemic. Jesus wants his disciples to have a biblically balanced perspective. We are to live in this chaotic, fallen world in light of the reality of eternity and of the present responsibilities and of our present responsibilities to the King. Jesus wants his first century and his 21st century followers to avoid the danger of becoming so consumed with looking at the events of this world, of trying to discern the times and signs in which we li are living that we neglect the more important and pressing matters, being faithful and diligent in serving him and working for his kingdom. We are not to put our heads in the sand and ignore what is going on in the world, but we are also not to become so preoccupied with the chaos and concerns and trajectories of this world that we neglect the Great Commission. Jesus begins this sermon by first talking, about, talking to the disciples about the nature of this fallen world as he describes this present age of birth pains. This present age, the age between Jesus' ascension after his resurrection and his return at the end of the age, will be a hard and difficult age for all people, and it will be especially challenging for believers. Our world is a cursed world. It is a world of tragedy and wars and hostilities and natural disasters and pandemics. There is so much pain and suffering in the world and in our lives and in the lives of those we know and love. The disciples are not to think that the presence of painful and evil things and of suffering is evidence that God is not real or that he is not in control. They are also not to look to these things as signs that Jesus' return is necessarily imminent. These things must happen, Jesus says, and they will characterize the entirety of the time period that the scripture calls the last days. The days that we are currently living in, the days that began when Jesus ascended and will continue 
until he returns. But not only that, but believers will endure difficulty because, as Jesus reminds his followers, the world that has rejected him will also reject and persecute those who declare their allegiance to him. Christians are to be prepared for opposition because there are many deceivers and liars whom Jesus refers to as false messiahs and false prophets. These individuals would seek to lead even faithful believers away from the truth. In addition, in this section, Jesus borrows a phrase from Daniel and talks about the abomination that causes desolation. He does so to refer to an intensely dark time for the faithful. Just as there were brutal days for God's people in times past, including during the destruction of Jerusalem, there will be intense persecution before the end. It will be so intense that the love of many professing believers will grow cold. In the midst of these things, Jesus again and again calls on his people to persevere. We are to know that this world will be a difficult world, full of trouble, snares, opposition, and persecution. And we are to know this so that we might not be deceived, but that we will press on in the faith. Jesus says, See, I have told you all these things ahead of time. Do not be surprised when these things come to pass. Do not let your faith be shaken. Know what you have believed. Know whom you have believed. And cling to him always, today and forever. Cling to him. Cling to the Messiah, to the Savior, because in him there is hope. We are to persevere because after a delay, a delay which we know to be a long delay, Jesus will return. His return will not be in conjunction with the destruction of Jerusalem, which occurred in 70 AD, but after the distress of the intense days that Jesus describes. When the days are complete, the Son of Man will appear. Jesus Christ will return in glory. The King will come back, and his clear message is that we are to be ready. We are to be watching for him and prepared for his arrival. To be ready means first that we are to believe in him as Savior, the only Savior, and that we are to live our lives recognizing that he is our rightful and glorious Lord and King. We are to believe in him as Savior. Jesus alone is the one who can cleanse a sinner of the guilt of their sin. The gospel message is that all those who come to him in repentance and faith will be saved. So are you ready? Have you come to Jesus as Savior? In addition, Jesus' expectation is that during the time of delay, we are to be active using the resources that he has given to us in his service. So are you ready? In that, are you living your life in service for Jesus, for his kingdom? Jesus gives the repeated warning in this sermon to be watchful because there are terrible consequences for those who are not ready for his return. And that brings us to the passage before us this morning, the sheep and the goats. This is one of the most sobering passages in all of the scriptures. It is an illustration of the final judgment. And the question that we must ask ourselves is, am I ready if Jesus were to return even today? Am I ready to face the judge? And even though the emphasis of this passage is the return of Jesus, we also see the wisdom of the psalmist who asks God to teach him to number his days. Our brief and fragile lives may be snuffed out at any moment. If that were to happen, are you ready? Jesus begins this section by affirming once again the return of the Son of Man. It is a certain return. Jesus will come back. Our second point is the coming judge. Jesus says, that this is what will happen when the Son of Man comes in all of his glory. And as you know, the Son of Man is a description that Jesus frequently uses to refer to himself. Jesus is the Son of Man. He is the one who has been given the name that is above every name, the name Lord. He is the Lord, the Lord over all, over all people, over all creation. The scriptures clearly teach us that Jesus is the King, and he will return and he will sit on his glorious throne, for he has come to reign. He has come to judge. The Lord is present in all of his astounding glory. The Lord reigns. 
Let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim. Let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. That's Psalm 99, 1 and 2. And then Psalm 96, verse 13. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes, he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. All of the nations will be gathered before him. Jesus is the Lord, the King, the judge over all. And all people will be called to give account before him. All nations without exception. And you will be there. When we read this section, it is easy to put ourselves in the role of a spectator. We are those who observe these events from a safe distance away. But on that day, you will be present in the midst of the congregation. You are included in all the nations. One day you will be standing, or to be more precise, you will be kneeling before Jesus Christ in complete awe of him. Before you on the throne of glory will be the perfect and righteous judge. All the nations are spread before Jesus, and then the all-wise Son of God divides the people into the sheep and the goats. When Jesus lived on earth, it would be common for sheep and goats to mingle together in the pasture during the day. But at night, they would be separated. The shepherd would come and call out the sheep, and they would be separated because they needed different levels of care. The disciples could see such an image in their mind's eye a large group of livestock being divided into two. And the division that Jesus makes is not based on gender, nationality, or social status, but on whether or not each individual has a relationship with him. Those who have faith are on one side, and those who do not are on the other. The sheep are put on the right. They are given the place of honor, and the goats are on the left. Then Jesus has a message for each, a glorious message for the sheep, and a terrifying message for the goats. Our third point is the message to the sheep. The king first addresses those on the right. To them he has a message of blessing and comfort. He begins by beckoning them. The good shepherd calls his sheep to come. They are to come because they are and they will be gloriously blessed by the Father. They are God's special people, those on whom his favor rests. They are to come and take their inheritance. The scripture teaches us that all things are Christ's to inherit, and that the sheep, God's children, are co-heirs with him. To the sheep, God will, in the coming ages, show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness in Christ Jesus. The other day we were listening to the children's program Adventures in Odyssey with the boys. In one of the episodes, three of the characters were surprised and excited to find out that they had been given an inheritance by a man from the community. They were each given an acre of land. It was an unexpected blessing. They were excited and happy and a little confused that they should inherit from this individual that they didn't even think they knew that well. The inheritance that we receive in the here and now from our parents or others is a temporary inheritance. The money will be spent. The land will be passed on. The items will grow old or be broken. But the inheritance that Jesus is talking about here is an eternal inheritance. This is an inheritance, Peter tells us, that can never perish, spoil, or fade. A perfect, glorious, abundant, satisfying inheritance kept in heaven for us. That is the promise of God. The sheep will know eternal joys. They have a place reserved for them in the magnificent kingdom of God. There is a room, or a mansion if you preferred, prepared especially for each sheep in the Father's house. And so Jesus bids the sheep to come, enjoy the glory of eternal life. This inheritance, Jesus says, is the kingdom, the heavenly and glorious kingdom of God, which has been prepared for them since the creation of the world. It has been prepared for the Messiah and for his people. And now, now is the time when it will be enjoyed forevermore. And note that Jesus says that this has been prepared for you since the creation of the world. 
The sheep are those who have been loved with an everlasting love. They were chosen by God to be inheritors before creation. This is the eternal grace of God. The Apostle Paul writes, He has saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. The sheep are to come and enjoy the kingdom of God, the blessings of eternity. They are those who have lived for Jesus in the present, and now they will enjoy eternity with him. The sheep who have been called by God to salvation have shown by their lives in the world that they truly are God's children. Their lives are adorned with Christian qualities, and Jesus knows particularly with acts of charity and kindness. Jesus' sheep are those who listen to his voice, and this means that they respond to his call for salvation, and it also means that they obey his commands and follow his examples. They walk in the footsteps of their shepherd. They have responded to his voice in faith, and as a result, their lives are devoted to him. Jesus highlights the virtues of the sheep. Now, we need to be clear that the sheep are not saved because they have done these works. They have not earned their place in heaven. It is the other way around. The good works are the fruit, not the root, of grace. They have received God's grace. The sheep are known by God and chosen by him. And because of their relationship with God through Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives, they will bear fruit. And the fruit shows that they truly are the children of God. It reveals that their shepherd is Jesus. Jesus says, Come into the inheritance because you have borne the fruit of faith and grace in your lives. Well, what did they do? They ministered to Jesus. When they saw Jesus hungry, they gave him something to eat. When Jesus was thirsty, they refreshed him. When Jesus was a stranger, they provided hospitality, inviting him in. When Jesus needed clothes, they sprang into action. When Jesus was sick, they cared for him. When Jesus was in prison, they came and visited him. They were diligent and faithful in seeking to ease any distress that Jesus was in. The sheep hear this, and they are confused. When did we do any of these things? When did we see you in need and minister to you? It would have been an honor and a delight to do so, but they cannot ever recall having had such an opportunity to minister to their precious Lord and Savior. Jesus says that when you did any of these things to the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it for me. Well, who is Jesus talking about? Who are his brothers and sisters? Well, he's talking about believers. It is important and in keeping with Christian character to help the poor and needy in general, but in this context, Jesus is thinking of how we respond to our brothers and sisters in the Lord. How we care for each other reflects what we think about Jesus. We show our love for and service of Jesus when we love and care for those for whom he died. Jesus loves each individual sheep so much that he gave his life for them. Remember the parable of the shepherd who goes to great lengths and risks danger to find that one precious lost sheep. If we say that we love Jesus and we know that he cares greatly for each of his sheep, then we too are compelled to show love for one another. The Apostle John writes in 1 John chapter 3, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Jesus set the pattern. He is the example. He laid down his life for us, and our response is that we are to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters in the Lord. And this love that we are to show, this laying down of our lives, is to be a practical love. We are to help and minister and care for one another. John continues, uh, 1 John 3, 17 and 18, If anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? Dear children, let us not love with words or speech, but with actions and in truth. And this is what God's people, the sheep of his pasture, have done. They have followed in the footsteps of the master, 
by loving each other. So Jesus says, Well done, sheep. Well done, good and faithful servants. Enter into your master's joy. Come and take your inheritance into the glorious, eternal kingdom of God. What a marvelous privilege for the faithful. But the text does not end on this high note. Our final point is the message to the goats. Now Jesus turns his attention to those on his left hand, the goats. And what a great contrast between the message to the sheep and the message to the goats. We love hearing about the future God has in store for his children. But the biblical teaching on hell is stomach churning. We cringe at the thought that those who do not repent and trust in Jesus will be cast out into eternal punishment, into hell. And though this is a terrifying doctrine, it is a biblical doctrine. This is the truth according to the Holy Word of God. The king will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Depart from me. Leave my presence. This is what the Son of God, the one who is so kind, so loving, so gentle, and so patient, says to the goats. And this isn't a temporary time out. This is eternal banishment from his presence. The contrast, the opposite of blessing, is cursing. The sheep are blessed, and the goats are cursed. An eternal curse hangs over them. They are to depart from the king and go into the eternal fire. The fire was prepared by God for the devil and his angels, and it will also be the place of punishment for those who have rebelled against the Lord and who did not bow the knee to him in faith. The goats are sent there because their lives were not characterized by the fruits of repentance and love for God. Jesus said that you neglected and did not minister to me. When I was present and in need, you did not feed me or provide for me or visit me. And the goats are shocked. When did we see you in need and not help you? Jesus says, When you failed to minister to one of my brothers and sisters, you did not minister to me. We are reminded of how closely Jesus identifies with his people. When Jesus appeared to Saul on the road to Damascus, he asked Saul why he was persecuting him. He did not say, why are you persecuting my people? Or why are you persecuting the church? But why are you persecuting me? And now Jesus is saying, why did you not minister to me? When any of my sheep, even the least of my sheep were in need and you turned away from them, you were turning away from me. 1 John 3.10, the apostle writes, this is how we know who the children of God are and who the children of the devil are. Anyone who does not do what is right is not God's child, nor is anyone who does not love their brother and sister. When the goats ask, when did we see you in need? They imply that if they had seen Jesus in need, if they had seen him in such a state, then surely they would have helped. But Jesus knows that is not the case. If their hearts were not soft to help any of Jesus' followers in need, then they would not have helped him either. The goats do not do what is right. They do not follow the command and example of Jesus. They are those who do not love. They have not believed in Jesus and their lives do not reflect a knowledge of the Savior and intimacy with him. And as a result, they will be cast out. They will be cast out of the presence of Jesus and they will be cast into eternal punishment. Hell will be a place of separation, separation from one another, and separation from that which is good. It is a place of darkness and agony. It is the most horrible of places. The wicked are cast into hell while the righteous enter into eternal life. Two groups, two very different destinies. It is with these heavy words that Jesus ends this sermon, the Olivet Discourse. These are the words that he wanted to leave the disciples with, knowing that his death was approaching. He sought to impress on them the urgency, the importance of following him. So what about you? Are you a sheep? 
when you hear what the scripture says about sheep being chosen by God and loved by him from the foundation of the world, you might be tempted to think that that absolves you of responsibility because God is the one who determines who is a sheep and who is a goat. But it does not absolve you of responsibility. Jesus is clear. He calls on all people to repent and believe. Come to me, Jesus says, and the sheep are the ones who hear his voice and come. So have you come to Jesus? Will you come to Jesus today? And if you are a sheep, then are you intentional in caring for other sheep? Do you follow the example of Jesus? Does your life show the fruit that is listed here? Do you care for other believers ministering to their needs, putting them first, and doing so because you know that Christ loves them deeply? And what about the goats? Do you seek to warn them? Does the condemnation of the goats kindle in your heart a passion for the lost? We are called to go forth with the message of the gospel. We are called to be the mouthpiece of Jesus and to repeat his words to a needy generation. We are to tell them to follow Jesus, to find life and peace and forgiveness in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will be hard work. When we tell other people the gospel, some will refuse, but some will turn and find life. There have been many moments of national pride this week. I love seeing my Canadian brothers and sisters on the world stage winning medals and winning gold. These are great accomplishments. But in light of eternity, even winning a gold medal in the hardest event in Olympic record fashion will pale in comparison with being a winner of souls. Jesus wants his followers to be ready. We are to discern the times. We are to know that this life will be hard and there will be a myriad of birth pains and troubles. But we are never to forget that Jesus will return. The master will surely come back. So let us be ready for his return. Let us serve him while we wait. We serve him by loving the sheep and by proclaiming the good news to all. The good news that Jesus saves. Amen. And let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word and for this sermon that Jesus preached so long ago. And our Father, we pray that we would learn the lessons. Our Heavenly Father, that we would be ready that our focus would not be on this present age, but in light of the certain return of Jesus Christ, we would be prepared, we would be watchful, that we would be serving one another, that we would be doing the work that you've left us to do, that we would be telling others, uh, encouraging them, and exhorting them to come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, our Father, give us the resources that we need to do this. Help us to be faithful to you, we pray. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen, and God bless.